Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm your host, Bob, and welcome back to the main track. Uh, coming up next, we have Xiong Zai. Yeah, he go, uh, his name is Xiong Zai. <laughs> and uh, he's a researcher at the Linux Foundation and a PhD candidate uh, in social data science, science at the University of Oxford. Uh, his area of interest in lies in the political economy of open source software. That's cool. <laughs> and today, uh, Kalen. Kaylen, okay. Kaylen will, will share insight on global open source trade and uh, dynamics. Uh, this session is a rare opportunity that uh, we can get an insider view uh, of the latest uh, Nidians Foundation research. So uh, let's welcome Xiong Zai. Of course. Hi, everyone. Um, happy COSCOP 2023. Um, my name is Kaylin or Shong Tsai, as Bob said, and it's a pleasure and privilege to speak to uh, speak to be at Coscup and speak to you today. Um, so today I'm going to give you some insights into research that we've done at the Linux Foundation. Um, there's a lot of content that I'd like to cover, and I only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to go quite quickly. Um, but if if anyone feels like I'm going too quickly, please raise your hand, and I'll take that as a sign that I should slow down a little bit. Um, also, feel free to take photos um, if you want to capture something and then look at it later, and feel free to speak to me afterwards. And lastly, there's some stickers here which you can help yourselves to afterwards. Um, so this is the agenda for the next 30 minutes. Firstly, I want to give you an introduction to the research team. Uh, secondly, I want to give you some insights into th three recent, recent research reports that we've published in the last uh, six months, and then finally give you a sneak peek into ongoing research. Um, so firstly, LF Research, a brief introduction, who are we? So maybe let me start by asking you a question. Who here is an open source software contributor? By contributor, I mean you contribute code, you contribute in any non-technical way to a community, um, or yeah, you're involved in open source in some way. Higher? So, okay, cool. A bunch of you. So what we do is we research you guys and how you work. And as you know, the Linux Foundation hosts, well, the Linux kernel, but actually over a thousand open source software projects. So our research is not limited to our own open source software projects, but we do a lot of research on our open source software projects, but also research on major policy issues. Um, for example, I'm based in Europe, and the European Union is working on legislation on laws that will affect open source, including the Cyber Resilience Act or the AI Act. Uh, so we take interest in that, but also uh, looking at regional and global trends. So some facts. We were founded only two years ago. Um, we use a combination of methodologies, qualitative interviews, quantitative surveys, and we also do some GitHub analytics and SCA uh, data analysis. And in two years, we've published 36 reports, so producing a lot, it's mostly not me. <laughs> I've only done two. Um, well, that's what we do. Uh, here are some reports that we've published since January. So I'm going to talk about three of them today. So open source maintainers, which we published last week. So this is uh, fresh out the press. Uh, op uh, global collaboration and measuring the economic value of open source. Um, so but we cover a range of topics. And then just quickly about me, as Bob said, my name is Kaylin or Shong Tsai. Uh, I re joined LF Research last year, and I'm also a PhD student. Uh, my PhD research, I focus on why and how companies collaborate in open source AI uh, developer communities. OK, but let's get into the research. So we have 25 minutes. So the first one I want to talk to you about is uh, measuring the economic value of open source. Uh, and this is a report that was written by a professor at Berkeley called Henry Chesborough. And he's been writing about open source software for uh, 20 years. And I should mention that a lot of our research to date has been based on partnerships with academics or industry researchers. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have been able to uh, have published over 35 reports in two years. So here's the QR code if you want to read up on it. Um, let's give me a second. Okay. 
So the methodology here uh, was just a quantitative survey of uh, Fortune 500 companies. Um, the aim was to understand uh, the, the kind of perceptions of the benefits and costs of using open source amongst Fortune 500 companies in the US. Um, we received about 439 usable responses. And here you see the types of companies that were included in the sample. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of findings from these reports. Um, and I'm not going to be reading out everything because there's too much. So I'll just focus on some of the interesting ones. So the th kind of three main uh, benefits that respondents uh, mentioned were cost savings, faster development speeds, and open standards and operability when they use open source software because they benefit from the collective kind of minds of open source communities. Um, so what else is interesting here? So almost two thirds of respondents report that the benefits of open source exceed the costs. Um, and here's another interesting one. So 31% of respondents reported that paying for equivalent software functionality would incur four times the cost of open source software. Um, so generally people there are many benefits, or the benefits outweigh the costs. So here's here are some numbers. So we see that cost savings is a major benefit. Faster development speed, so we mentioned this earlier, but here you see exactly. This is another one, open standards and interoperability. Um, six security, this is one. It, I assume many of you have heard the, the debate about whether proprietary software or open source software is more secure. And a lot of um, kind of CIOs and IT managers at Fortune 500 companies report that uh, they perceive open source software as being highly secure. So that's uh, encouraging for the open source software uh, ecosystem. And these are the main costs that you can see. So what's interesting here. So hidden support costs is a major issue. Uh, security gaps, um, cost of training st internal staff, because um, as, as you're aware, you know when you um, get commercial software, you normally contract it out to a company that pr have teams that that help you implement the software. Whereas when you use o open source software, typically you need developers in your company to know how to use open source software, how to exchange with the open source community. Um, and if you don't have those, you have to find kind of consultancies which can provide you the support. So just in the interest of time, I might move towards the, yeah, I'll move towards the next report. So this one came out last week. Um, it's, is anyone here an open source maintainer? One, two, two, three. Cool. Um, so yeah, so what we were doing here was researching Kind of the practice. Oh, who are these? Who are maintainers? Their practices, um, and kind of recommendations they have for other maintainers. So here's the report, and here's the QR code. If anyone would like to scan it. So as I said, it came out last week. So this is our newest report. Um, well, this this is pretty obvious. Three of you are maintainers, and many of you are open source developers. Main maintainers are so important. Um, a big problem that we face is, is maintainer burnout um, because a few maintainers are doing a lot of the work. And I mean, lots of people know this, and a lot of people have done research on this. The two things that we've done here are firstly a report on the free and open source software contributor survey, which came out uh, in 2018, and then this census, which I'll talk about in a second, which was an analysis we did with researchers at Harvard University where we looked at uh, kind of dependency networks and key, key dependency, open source software dependencies. Um, and so based on this, we wanted to identify um, best practices. So this is the census I mentioned, and it's really important for our methodology here. So we did 32 interviews with super maintainers. So who are the super maintainers? They are kind of the principal maintainers in some of the most important open source software projects that exist. Those were identified through this census research. Um, and it covers a range of things from well, Linux, Kubernetes, uh, NumPy, PyTorch, um, PostgreSQL, yeah, so a range of different uh, open source software projects. Um, and the aim was to kind of, yeah, cover as much of the yeah, diverse open source software ecosystem. Here's uh, a QR code to the census in case you're interested in looking at it. Um, 
So essentially, it's just a, li a, a ranked list of open source software projects based on dependencies. So here are the kind of the main findings. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to focus on the best practices that we identified. Um, so what do we see that's interesting here? So um, one of the main findings is that most, main, so most of these super maintainers are paid uh, by their companies full time to do the work they do. Many companies hire maintainers because of their influence or their ability to influence projects. Um, so only 35% of interviewees said that their project had a strong new contributor pi pipeline. This is a big problem. Um, because who here is familiar with the bus factor measurement or basically over Could you explain it to the group? Exactly. Who here is familiar with the, the co well, how, wh why people call it the bus factor? Anyone? Well, that basic idea is this was when early days of, of working on the Linux kernel, uh, Linus Torvalds had a lot of influence, and people were worried, well, what happens if, if Linux gets hit by a bus? Um, will the project continue? And so since then, bas the basic measurement of the bus factor is what is the smallest amount of user uh, maintainers that contribute at least 50% of commits? Um, so maintainer burnout is a major problem, right? And so if you have a low bus factor, if we rely on very few maintainers. What if they burn out? What if they leave? Um, given that, it's very important to have pipelines to get new contributors and for them also to, to kind of um, to grow in the hierarchy of projects and become maintainers. Anyway, so. This report really focuses on best practices that maintainers recommend. So there are six categories. So here are the first three. Um, I really recommend reading the report because these are of, these are just the, the headings of the various best practices. And we have about half a page on each. Um, but here are some recommendations and best practices for uh, improving contributor experience. So one is about um, making kind of first contributions as easy as possible and making first-time contributors feel welcome in the community. So setting up an automated greeting bot and, and an onboarding guide is, was recommended by a bunch of super maintainers. Using inclusive language, so by that we mean a few things, including um, one of the problems is that many, if not most, um, super maintainers are US American or Western European, and so they use, typically use certain slang or re regional phrases and so on. And that um, tends to make participation amongst others who, whose la first language is not English, or even if their first language is English, but they're not from those parts of the world, not familiar with, those, with that type of English, it makes it kind of intimidating. Um, it's also a big problem we have is that open source software communities are mostly male and quite masculine spaces which makes it um, unfriendly, often an unfriendly environment for, for women or um, non-binary people, and so on. Another recommendation is to use tags on GitHub or other functionalities on other platforms to suggest bugs for first-time contributors. So uh, a typical one is called a good first issue. Um, so that helps onboard new contributors. Second category of uh, best practices are community governance and management. So a lot of interviews talked about establishing code of conduct. That sh hopefully should be quite obvious. Um, the, se the second one I find is uh, quite interesting, which is designing yourself out of your job ASAP. And this corresponds to the bus factor problem, which is uh, you would want your project to be able to continue without you. Um, third, uh, providing radical transparency. And fourth, distributing power and decision making, whether that involves um, kind of modular decision making, setting up, setting up working groups, or something else. Um, the third category is documentation. Um, hopefully, this is obvious to you, but yeah, making document, documentation, good documentation, a priority. And there are various ways of doing this. Um, some mentioned if, if you have the funds, hiring people to focus on documentation writing and or uh, publicly praising documentation writers for their efforts. Um, so that could be in a mailing list or 
however, on social media or however you communicate with your communities. Here are the next three categories. So one is diversity, so making diversity, equity inclusion a priority for the, the community, um, offering uh, pair mentoring, uh, offering mentoring um, and pairing that with diversity efforts, and thirdly, participating in third party programs to boost diversity. And Outreachy was a program that many or a few of the super maintainers recommended. Um, the, the fifth category was avoiding burnout. Um, so we've mentioned this a few times. Um, so these are just kind of personal tips if you're a maintainer. So <laughs> does this uh, resonate with any of the three maintainers here? It does? Which one? All of it, okay. Yeah, so yeah, set your boundaries and stick to them. It's easier said than done. Um, and yeah, accepting that open source is always on and embrace the hybrid lifestyle um, and recognize that you'll never finish your job. Uh, and then the, the final one is funding. Um, so this funding situation is different for different types of projects from small independent projects where you have five contributors to you know, PyTorch, which was developed by, by Meta or Facebook Meta and now it's part of the Linux Foundation, which has um, over you know, about 3,000 contributors with the overall community is around 30,000, you know. <laughs> they have the funds of Meta and now Linux Foundation. So the funding situation and needs are uh, vary between projects. So the various recommendations for maintainers. So we have 13 minutes left, so I'll move on to the third important. Hi, welcome. Um, so this is on global enabling global collaboration, how open source leaders are confronting the challenges of fragmentation. You might be asking, what does fragmentation mean? Um, here's the report and the QR code in case anyone wants to read it. So, well, fragmentation means um, kind of global in terms of the geography, so different world regions working on similar things and duplicating efforts. Uh, it could be in terms of software, duplicating efforts, you know, uh, similar libraries doing similar things. Um, it could mean a, a, a range of things, so we'll get into that. So this is kind of the motivating question. So today, the global open source ecosystem consists of millions of projects and an equally large and regionally diverse constellation of participants. Um, however, the proliferation of open source projects and organizations also raises a vital question. Is fragmentation in the open source community impeding its progress? So this report digs into this question. Um, here was the methodology, interviews with open source leaders from around the world, whether they were in companies or foundations, and the interviews focused on the challenges of fragmentation for three things. Firstly, development of open source solutions. Secondly, integration of diverse contributors from various regions of the world. And finally, governance. So, these were some of the key findings. So open source has developed a lot, right, in the last 30 years. Um, many more people are involved and come from all over the world and do different things. Um, yet the lingua franca of open source remains to be English. Um, and that causes challenges for participation for people who may not speak English or don't speak English so well. Um, so here's another thing that uh, various interviewees mentioned, which is, Yes, we have way more projects, but also we have way more foundations. Um, you know, I'm from the Linux Foundation, you also have the Apache Software Foundation, the Eclipse Foundation, all doing very, very similar things. Um, hundreds or thousands more foundations. Um, so this is a problem, um, because there are kind of duplication of efforts, but also competition sometimes between foundations on issues where we actually have shared interests. Um, Techno-nationalism poses a big problem. I'm going to get into this in a second, but um, yeah, some of the one of the interviews was from from China, mainland China, and said that um, it, developers in China were concerned about U.S. well, the, the, the trade wars going on with the United States of America and what would that would mean for their access to various developer tools and platforms. Um, and then, yeah, language, culture, and geopolitics are a major barrier to participation, as I said. Next set of findings are, um, so kind of various ways to tackle fragmentation. Um, one of the kind of issues that a few interviews mentioned is that, you know, fragmentation is a double-edged sword. 
because efforts to close or uh, decrease fragmentation could um, disrupt many efforts, many communities are, are have their kind of ways of working and could stifle open source innovation. Um, this one here I'm gonna focus on in a second because a lot of ecosystem leaders, in particular foundation leaders, said that's really important that foundations work more together. In Europe, this has been a major issue concerning legislation and policy where you know big tech companies tend to have armies of <laughs> lobbyists and lawyers in Brussels speaking to members of the European Parliament and or um, kind of bureaucrats in the European Commission, whereas open source foundations or projects don't really have any representatives. So one of the recommendations that is, was that open source foundations should do more to coordinate their kind of lobbying efforts. Um, now, open source foundations don't really lobby per se, so what they mean by that is kind of communicate or exchange expertise. Um, and then two other ones are about safeguarding critical open source infrastructure. So that involves funding. And fourth is um, combating techno-nationalism through open development practices. So I'm just gonna focus on three quotes from different interviews um, to give you perspectives from different parts of the world. Um, so this one is from uh, head of the Drone Code Foundation in Mexico, uh, who talked about the dominance of US American developers in projects, communities, and foundations, how that makes it intimidating or difficult for developers from Latin America to contribute. Um, so, and that problem extends beyond Latin America to all world regions where English is not a uh, dominant or native language. This is a perspective from China, which was, as I mentioned earlier, uh, concerns about what the, the trade wars between US and mainland China mean uh, for developers in China. Uh, that includes access to platforms like GitHub or GitLab, which would no longer be uh, accessible. And this is a view from, from Europe. So Astor is Swedish, but he's based in Brussels. Uh, he's at the Open Forum found, uh, Europe. Um, and digital sovereignty has become a major issue um, in, in Europe in the last three years. Uh, initially, he's kind of spearheaded by the French government, by Emmanuel Macron, the French president, subsequently by the German government, and now it's a European agenda, which is to reduce dependence on mainly US and Chinese technology providers um, and be to become, so the, the key term here is strategic autonomy and open source software is seen by policymakers across Europe as a strategic vehicle for achieving strategic autonomy or digital sovereignty. So, um, and I'm gonna speak a bit about this in a second when I give you a sneak peek into ongoing research we have going on. So as I said earlier, lots of op open source software foundation leaders said that they need to do more to, to coordinate and communicate um, when, when it comes to open source software project formation, uh, when it comes to you know, speaking to policymakers, I said lobbying. We don't like to use that word because we're, it's not really what we do, but basically exchanging expertise with policymakers. So this happened last week. This was the first open source congress of its kind where um, leadership of various foundations from around the world met up in Geneva and spoke about um, their priorities, the challenges they face, and they reached some agreements. Uh, so we'll, in the coming months, there'll be announcements about kind of key kind of resolutions that came out of this and a joint statement from the various foundations. So this is quite interesting and exciting um, for kind of in the world of open source software foundations. So finally, um, we have five minutes left. A sneak peek into what we're doing at the moment. So the first is we've just finished a survey on OSPOs. Who here is familiar with OSPOs? Okay, they're quite a new concept. So they're open source program offices. It's a model that was um, pioneered in industry, but now more and more governments are creating os open source program offices, or OSPOs for short. And they're um, the center of competence for open source within organizations. Um, there's a research paper by Ant Group that came out recently studying 
um, the OSPO in uh, various companies owned by, uh, subsidiaries of Ant, the Ant Group, and they describe OSPOs as internal diplomats and external diplomats. So they're internal diplomats because they champion open source within their organization, but they're external diplomats because they represent their organization within open source software communities. Um, and when it comes to governments, so, so far in Europe, where I'm based, 12, so the European Union is, as, as you will know, a union of 27 member states, it was 28 when the UK was involved in the EU, which is where I'm from, um, but we left a few years ago, as you know. Um, anyway, so 12 out of 27 member states have an OSPO, and the European Union also has an OSPO. And so many of those OSPOs communicate with each other and share best practices. So, um, at least in the government space, OSPOs are emerging as a kind of best practice or a way of really advancing open source adoption and development in the public sector. So that's going on. This is another one. Uh, so thank you to COSCUP for helping us uh, distribute this. Um, was anyone from COSCUP here involved in doing that? Or Well, Peter, the program chair, was very involved in, in sharing it uh, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Japan. And anyway, so this is a global survey where we're trying to understand trends that were, are going on around the world. Um, so that report, the reports for different world regions will come out in the next couple of months. So that's very exciting for us. Um, and this is what I've been working on for the last couple of months, where I've done, I've spoken to 30 people from around Europe, from 16 different countries in Europe about open source software strategies in their governments. Um, and based, so here basically these are two images from the European Union and then, has anyone heard of the Sovereign Tech Fund? We have one nod. Okay, so the Sovereign Tech Fund was established last year by the German government for funding open source, critical open source software projects, um, for actively recognizing open source software as critical digital infrastructure for nation states. So that's very exciting. So this report will be coming out uh, next month with uh, kind of a summary of what's happening in Europe and recommendations to governments in Europe and beyond Europe about open source software use. Okay, so we have two minutes left for questions, uh, but firstly I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. Um, feel free to approach me afterwards. I'm happy to speak about these things and there are stickers here, so please help yourselves. Thank you. Any question? No. Okay. Are there questions? Just, just two. Uh, do you have any idea for creating a much better contributor pipelines? Um, thank you, Anonymous. Um, well, so that really depends on um, the project, right? It's hard to say in the abstract. Um, so it really depends on what already exists. If nothing exists yet, um, or if it's just you and you want to attract contributors, um, well, firstly, you need to make your project known. So <laughs> the various ways of doing that, online and offline. Um, say you're a student, maybe you could organize a hackathon or something like that. It, say the project already has contributors, um, you're trying to get new contributors, well, then it depends on what communication channels you have. Um, the mailing list is important, but maybe most people who are subscribed to the mailing list are already contributors, so trying to get new ones are maybe on social media, or you could go to conferences like COSCUP, or you go to FOSDEM. Um, or other conferences and meet people. So maybe that's a good way. I recommend uh, Anonymous reading um, this report um, on maintainers and seeing the best practices. Um, so to follow, follow my, my previous question, the documentation should include what kind of topic to create an easy to join environment. Um, sorry, I don't understand this question, so. Uh, I think he's, uh, he or she, I, I don't know. He, uh, that's asking uh, what kind of the information should a documentation be included to help people easier to join the environment? 
to join the project? To yeah, yeah, to so that's yeah. a good question. So again, the report has a lot of uh, recommendations and information about good documentation writing. Um, so if it's for new contributors, maybe this includes um, ways of identifying um, good first contributions. So any issues that need support that don't need extensive expertise about how the project or the software works, um, as well as recommended pull requests, or maybe something non-technical. As you know, um, a lot of open source software uh, development doesn't <laughs> is kind of involves like social work, community animation, um, and representation. So maybe there are ways you can help with um, brand awareness. You know, if you're you know organizing events at conferences like Coscup or posting on social media. Um, maybe those are good things. Um, but yeah, please uh, have a look at the report and it'll, you'll find out more about good documentation writing. Okay. Oh yeah. So, uh, how, how effective was the lobbying effort uh, by the Linux Foundation within European governments? Like, was it effective, or like, do you did you have any uh, roadblocks? So, two answers to that question. Firstly, we don't we haven't measured it yet, so there are no measurements to <laughs> give you. But secondly, I guess the one way to measure it is that a big concern is the Cyber Resilience Act, which is basically a legislation about the cybersecurity of Internet of Things. And it's being it's in the drafting process, and the concerns of the open open source software ecosystem at large have not been well sufficiently uh, or satisfactorily uh, addressed. So maybe that's a measurement that the kind of these lobbying efforts have been unsuccessful. Um, hopefully, we'll see more kind of coordinated activity following the congress that took place last week. Um, and just for some context here, the concern about this one legislation or this law is that if there are cybersecurity breaches or, or whatever, that there could be liability falling on open source software developers who aren't involved in making the products. Um, but those products rely on those open source software uh, libraries to function. Um, and so one thing that we're pushing for is for this legislation to clearly say that the open source software developers are not responsible or liable for the use of the software and any kind of uh, breaches or kind of incidents that could happen afterwards. Okay, I think we're over time now, so yeah. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Okay. Thank okay. you, everyone. No uh, okay, let's give you a hand. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next session will be on 3 o'clock, so uh, I'll see you then. <laughs>